Well, the first thing we did was fire Rick Wagner. Um, uh, and I was kind of, I was the one who ended up doing it because nobody else really wanted to. And I didn't really want to, but somebody had to do it. Uh, and I was really quite shocked at the reaction. We were all quite shocked at the, po at the uh, public's reaction to this. Of, well, you know, how can the government fire Rick Wagner? Well, because he wasn't, you know, Rick's a good guy. He's an honorable guy. He's a decent guy. He worked very hard. But it was a failure. It simply wasn't working. And part of the, part of the um, thesis of private equity is you're backing a management team. You're backing a business model, as I talked about, but you're also backing a management team. And we did not have a management team there that we could back. And so we had to make that change. Uh, we also then encouraged Fritz Henderson, his successor, to make a number of other management changes, which occurred. We, uh, I, I view the board's role, as I said, as critical and also not having been well uh, discharged. And so we changed half of the board including bringing in several private equity investors, because I do believe that the private equity discipline is, is a useful one, even in a public company like General Motors. And in fact, as some of you probably know, maybe all of you know, uh, Dan Ackerson, who's somebody that we put on the board for this purpose, uh, is now the CEO of the company. And then one thing I tried to do, which maybe not everybody in this room would agree with me about, uh, was I tried to split the role of CEO and chairman. I believe that you do need to have, I believe that the, the model of having an independent chairman who is not the CEO is, a, is generally speaking a better model for a company than combining those roles. And as you know, in Europe that is very much the custom to have a separate, separate roles. In the US, it really was very rare to see them separate until the last 10 or 20 years. Now you see it somewhat more often. I think it should be the general rule. And so my view was that we should have a CEO and we should have a chairman, and I did managed to put that in place, although it then sort of slipped away as the, as the years went on. But we uh, made Fritz Henderson, who had been Rick's deputy, the CEO, and then Ed Whitaker, who had been the uh, chairman and CEO of AT&T and a very successful one, became the chairman here, as well as, as I said, replacing half the board. And then we had to focus on the, on the business model itself and what was this company going to do and how are we going to make it profitable again. And so, essentially, there had to be a dramatic right-sizing of the uh, products of General Motors. We, they had to essentially get themselves down to a size in terms of both facilities and products that was commensurate with what we thought the market was going to be. And we did, not, we did not want to assume that car sales were going to go back to 15 or 16 million. We wanted this company to be able to make money at much lower levels of car sales. Um, and so we had major negotiations with the unions, and the unions, recognizing the problem, did agree to eliminate all those job uh, classifications that I talked about. They did agree to eliminate practices, for example, at uh, GM, if you work, and for that matter, at Ford and Chrysler. If you worked 12 hours on Monday uh, and eight hours uh, on Tuesday and then four hours the other three days, you still got overtime for Monday, even though you hadn't actually worked 40 hours in the course of a week. Um, most of us, at least in the U.S., and I know some of you are not from the U.S., get July 4th off. At General Motors, they got the whole week of July 4th off. And so a lot of these practices had to change, and the union happily recognized that there needed to be some changes, and we were able to get the, uh, the cost back into line. And then I mentioned before the dealer problem. That is partly a legal problem that, as I said, you can't just eliminate these dealers. But by using the bankruptcy tool, and I won't go into bankruptcy today, that's a whole kind of another presentation. But by using the bankruptcy tool, we were able to uh, eliminate a lot of dealers, not probably as many as we would have liked, but enough to get that dealer footprint back to something that made some sense. So what did the company look like kind of before and after? So General Motors had eight brands. It was way too many, uh, given what was going on in the world. So it came down to four. We eliminated Pontiac. We eliminated Saturn, a couple of smaller brands. The number of assembly plants in the US, again, they just had too many. It went from 21 to 16, which meant that their capacity went down as well. I mentioned briefly the dealers that we cut by roughly a third. And then unfortunately, and look, I, I, came, I took this job working in the government to try to save jobs, not eliminate jobs. Um, but sometimes you have to eliminate jobs to save the remaining jobs. And this is this sort of relentless focus on costs that I think you're hearing a lot about today and that I think is a critical part of being successful as a company. So when you add all this stuff together, 
the GM structural costs went from about $34 billion a year down to $24 billion a year. And here's what I referred to a minute ago. They needed, in 2007, they needed 16.4 million cars to be sold in this country just to break even, a number that we had only barely reached a few times. By the time we got done, if car sales were as low as 10.5 million in this country, they would actually uh, make money. And then on the labor costs that I talked about, we essentially, our mandate was to get those labor costs down to be competitive with Toyota. I wouldn't say we got 100% of the way there, but by making some of the changes that I described to you in terms of overtime pay and things like that, uh, we were able to get the cost down close enough so that GM uh, could make money uh, the way Toyota did. So what did that, what did that uh, mean in terms of the, the difference in actual outcomes? So now, you know, this is all great. This is theory. This is what we kind of uh, imagine sitting in the Treasury Department, you know, drawing on whiteboards could happen. What actually did happen? So in 2008, GM's revenues were $150 billion. They went down to 136. Um, nobody likes to see revenues go down. We all want to grow our businesses, not shrink our businesses. But we, ha we were focused on profitability and on this company becoming profitable. And when we eliminated those four brands uh, and we eliminated some of our dealers, uh, there was obviously going to be some impact on revenues.